to talk about Unicode uh, and the difference between how Unicode is handled in Python 2 and Python 3. Um, first, Unicode. Oh, well, well, there's something wrong here. Let me. Ah, that's better. Uh, <laughs> But first, let me, let me go way back in time and talk about what's our encoding and what, are, what, what is Unicode and where did it came, all come from, right? So we all know what an encoding is, right? Because we all know Morse code. We've all heard about the telegraph, olden times, people with long mustaches, bit, bit, bop, bop. And it's a way to encode uh, letters and numbers, right? Such that a machine can read and write them. So a machine in this case would be a telegraph, so a wire with an electrical signal going through them. And us humans would write out our things in letters, but then t uh, tap with d uh, dashes and dots to transfer that by machine, right? Well, um, this encoding format, this is a way to encode text, has a couple of characteristics. It uses a ternary system. There's three types of bits. There's the long dash, the short dash, and there's also the pause, so between two letters, you'll have an actual pause. This is all standardized in the 19th century, so telegraph people can understand themselves across uh, continents. Another thing, it's variable length, right? So if I try to go back quickly, you'll see, for example, the A is dot dash, so it's only two symbols, two uh, bits, theoretically, as opposed to, say, the Y, which is four bits, right? So you can't guess right, how long, how many letters a piece of Morse will contain. You have to decode that Morse to figure out how many letters it is, right? So if you're trying to, I don't know, fit it on a computer screen, you'll have to go through letter by letter, right? And finally, there's no special characters. In Morse code, there's only letters and numbers. That's why in telegraphs, in olden, th olden times, all your sentences had S-T-O-P at the end, because you didn't really, couldn't really get a period. All those three things kind of make it kind of crappy for computers, right? Computers are really good at, well, electronics, so the core of it, your CPUs, your memory, are really good at saying zero from one, so a negative voltage from a positive voltage, but a, tr a ternary system would be very difficult or just not worth the price of electronics for it. So all our electronics work on a binary system. And that's one reason why we can't use it. Variable length encoding is kind of crappy for computers because Variable length encoding, not brilliant from computers. All our memory accesses, so when you fetch stuff from either RAM or more specifically hard drives, usually in modern computings, modern computers you've used in the last 40 years, you'll get uh, what's called bytes, so a series of eight of these bits of, of zeros and ones. Are we all right? So this is why, through, after much trepidation and different things and, and standards from IBM nobody uses that we don't want to talk about, we invented ASCII, right, in 1963. It was standardized. It is the American, I knew this five minutes ago, something, something, standard for, for sorry? Information interchange. Information interchange, right? Um, what does it contain? 09, A to Z. Come punctuation, it has what I call 128 glyphs, so 128 symbols that you can represent, right? And the key here is it contained in seven bits, right? So it's a seven bit length encoding. Two to the power of seven, 128, so you can have 128 different symbols. If you look at an ASCII table, not all those symbols are visual, some of them will be transparent. There'll be things like return line, space, end of transmission. A uh, record separator, all these whole load of things that 1960s they found useful, right? And some of us still do today, like return lines. Um, right, but why seven bits? So we have eight bit computers, one byte is a bit. If you do a read off a file in most, uh, in most modern operating systems, you'll get a byte of data, you'll get eight bits. Well, in seven bits, you have that extra bit you can kind of use. The most common use for it was called a par what's called a parity bit. So you can encode your, your ASCII letter as a series of ones and zeros. And in this, in this case, I have five ones. So I'll add an extra one at the top, to make it six ones, and make it an even number of ones, right? So let's say I'm transferring this over a wire. Maybe I have like a guy of a telegraph who does zeros and ones. Maybe I have carrier pigeons that each carry like a big zero for zero, a big one for one, and one of those pigeons get eaten by a falcon or something. Well, let's say I lose that X, right? Well, I'll see, oh, there's a one here, there's one, 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 one here. 
So by deduction, that must be a zero, and then I get my letter back, right? So I can sh show parity. That's very common in uh, networking. Routers will do that for you automatically if you pay for enough for them. Um, but, so we have a standard, right? And we can communicate. It's everything's happy, fine. I don't, we sorted that out in the 60s. We got a man on the moon, woohoo. Not exactly. The problem is the rest of the world, right? All these diff different languages had different characters and weird ways to count money. And, and even some people started proposing other characters that they wanted in books and different letters, right? So this one guy, uh, well, this whole committee uh, started ISO, IEC 8859 1, 1998. I think that had the Euro 1998, the latest version, more commonly known to, uh, to friends and, uh, and family as Latin 1. Uh, can everybody hear me? I just heard it cut out. Okay, cool. Um, Latin 1 is probably the most common Western European encoding, weird encoding that you'll see. Uh, really popular in the 80s. Uh, if you ever have to deal with CSV files from Excel, they will usually be in Latin 1. So that's, that's where I mostly see it. Um, what they did was, they used that extra bit, right? So they said, okay, those last seven bits, that's going to be ASCII. If you, see those seven, if you see a zero in front, you just take the seven next bits, you look at your ASCII table, you pop up with that character. If you see a one in front, I'm going to slip in another table, right, that has the same, like a different series of 128 bits, uh, 120 glyphs from ASCII, where I can start putting all my weird accents and umlauts and, and all that stuff, right? So I have a, a, this whole bank of another 128 characters I can use, right? And, okay, if I'm dealing with Americans, I just, or people from the UK, I just put ASCII all the way and we're all happy. If I got a French guy or a German guy, well, I tell him it's under Latin one code page. Maybe he can pay me for my software that supports that, and suddenly it'll work on his la on his computer, right? So, oh, pop quiz: Can you use Latin one to write in French? Who thinks? Raise their hand. Or well, who disagrees? Because it's, uh, all right, okay. What happens is you do not get the capital Y diersis, donc le i majuscule tréma, which basically only comes up in the French language when you have like five cities in France, when you, ca when you print them in caps. So they don't fit in Latin one. So if you're ever worried about that, you now have an answer. Right, but what characteristics does Latin one have? One, uh, one byte glyphs. So all the glyphs are represented in one byte. This is really important for all your encoding needs because, for example, if I use grep from system three Unix, all it's going to understand is one byte things from ASCII, right? So even if it was a seven bit character, it's all going to load in one byte. So if my encoding works in one byte, I can pass it through all my ASCII tools I can buy from my American vendors, and I don't have to change the code because it all fits in one byte, right? Um, one byte's also really useful that I have a file that's 350 bytes long. I know it is 350 characters long. I have a line that's 70 bytes long. Well, I need 70 spaces in my monospaced mono font to show it on my screen, for example. So basic text tools work uh, between text editors, uh, all your Unix uh, text tools uh, just work with this one byte encoding, right? And also backwards compatible with ASCII. So I have an ASCII file, it's also Latin 1. So I have a Latin 1 text editor. It, as long as I don't use any accents or any all the glyphs that are available in ASCII, it'll write out an ASCII file I can pass on to somebody who has a computer with tools that only read ASCII files, right? So this is such a good idea that everybody started doing it. So you started having standards for Western and Central Europe, so maybe more of the carrots. So you'd have the code pages, right? You say, this file, Latin one, you'd have to tell people what code page it is for them to read it on screen. Uh, you had different ones, the Thais got onto it, Russians. Um, Mac OS, like, you know, Mac OS version like 3 in the 1980s developed their own version independent from Latin 1. I've never seen it myself. Um, oh, the Japanese one is kind of interesting because it's not a one byte system. So, uh, talking about Latin 1, it all fits in one byte. This one had multi byte characters because Japanese has much more than 256 different symbols. So, to fit it in, they had to use multiple bytes. 
but it's a pain, right? So everybody had their little different standard. You had a text editor that worked here. You'd save it under format. You'd read it somewhere else. Your grandma was like, it's all garbled. What is this? And you're like, oh, use this code page. Oh, I don't have this code page installed. Oh, I don't have the internet, so we're all screwed. And go to the software store and try to buy your way out of it. So um, another standard came about, Unicode. The one code to rule us all, right? Uh, we all knocked our coconuts together, and 1991 decided we're going to go with Unicode. Hooray! What is it? It is currently more than 110,000 characters, covering 100 scripts and various symbols. So um, what they call a grapheme, which is basically a letter, has a unique code point, which is basically just a number that can be encoded as binary, decimal, uh, hexadecimal, also classic way you'll represent it. But whenever you see grapheme, it's a type of letter. Modulo, maybe some like weird symbol and whatever. And then code point is basically number. Uh, Latin 1, so all the code points. So Latin 1 will describe numbers. So uh, an example, I think, a uh, Latin 1 is a superset of ASCII. So a letter in ASCII will have a, a number. I'll have the same number in Latin 1, and I'll have the same code point in, in Unicode. And I'll explain how this changes a bit later. But the key is, oh, that's all Unicode is. So when you hear Unicode, just think it's this huge bank of PDFs, basically, on the internet, for all intents and purposes, of uh, numbers matching to a specific type of letter or character. Okay? So that's the problem, right? What does it, how does it matter to you, right? I know this letter somewhere exists in the effort and it has this representation as a number, but how do I print it out on my printer? How do I show it on my screen? How do I show it in my web browser? Well, at that point, the Unicode committee proposed uh, UCS2, a Unicode ca uh, code point system, I think, two. Um, two is for two bytes, because initially they didn't have the 110,000. I think they limited themselves to under 65,000. So if you took two bytes, right, and you just dumped that into your file, you could represent all those two, uh, any one of those 65,000 different characters. So what it literally was, was, you know, like C structs dumped to a file, uh, one after the other, right? So every letter took two bytes. But you could show, you, you, if everybody used that, between the Thais, the French, the Germans, and the Americans, one file would be convertible everywhere, would show up on the screen at the same way for everyone. They wouldn't be ha fighting with encoding. However, uh, one really painful part of it is uh, they decided to, to depend on uh, your architecture's byte order and the inness, right? So um, uh, if you don't notice, it's the, you're lucky if you never had to fight with this, uh, different architectures. So x86, I think, is backwards, where it'll, it'll deal with numbers uh, larger than 256 in that the, da, 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 the most important... Anyways, it's complicated, it's a pain. I know PowerPC is different from x86. x86 is an archaic way, but it's x86. Everything's archaic in x86. I have no idea what ARM is. I think you can choose. There might be a switch on the CPU oh. itself. Um, so one other problem you see is, depending on your computer's architecture, would dump two different files that, two different, uh, that another person could not read, right? It's limited to six, uh, 65,000 uh, code points. Because it's only two bytes, there's no bits left to show anymore. So if you, got, if you wanted to show off your Klingon, Klingon, because Unicode eventually got to it, or as I show in this uh, presentation, all my emojis, those are in higher code points beyond their numbers in Unicode, is above 65,000, you can't show it in UCS. right? Um, and, but the base plane, so one, one detail, the base plane is Latin 1. What they, when you hear the term plane in uh, Unicode, it's basically uh, a series of 250, uh, 256 characters, so basically the last byte in your number for that, for, for that thing. And so basically the, 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 what's called the, the base plane, the lower level plane, the simplest one, so is Latin 1. And if for other languages, they'll go beyond that. So they'll start with like a zero or one or two, and then another byte going through those characters. Also, UCS 
Two has one huge problem for Americans and all English speakers: it takes twice as much space as ASCII. If you have an ASCII file, you'll have to you have to take every character in your ASCII file and 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 proceed it by zero 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 to make it a UCS2 file. So suddenly you have to double the space. I know you can zip that theoretically, but that's the answer to everything, and it never really works. You still have to grep through the file, and it takes twice as much memory and it's twice as much of a pain, right? So in 1993, Ken Thompson and Rob Pike, so two of the guys who helped with Unix way, 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 way back, were working on a Plan 9, an OS nobody uses, that, uh, <laughs> and found that okay, UCS sucks. We need a better system. They invented uh, UTF-8. So it's uh, Unicode tr uh, Transformation Format 8. The 8 stands for 8. Uh, bits, so it's showed by one byte at a time. I'll explain how it works. So basically, um, it's what's called a multi-byte system. This is uh, you, you. So a character can either be represented by up to one to four bytes. I think even five or six nowadays, if you want to try to reach those higher code points. So if I have a character of one byte, it'll start with a zero. None of the other characters start with a zero. It'll start with a zero and I'll have seven bits floating around. Hey, go figure, what a coincidence. ASCII fits in seven bits. So if you have a character that starts with the, the most uh, important byte is a zero, you have an ASCII character, you can use all your ASCII tools to fight with it, and you're fine, right? And you don't need to know about Unicode, higher code points, uh, whatever had unification is, this is all details to you, you know you're dealing with ASCII and that's all you can ask. So maybe I'm writing a file system, Okay, my, my file names just, can just be ASCII, and I can still use uh, UTF tools. Oh, I want to reach uh, French characters, right? So I want to uh, hit more options for characters. Well, you just, can, you just uh, concatenate all these bits together, and it'll form you a number, a binary number, and that binary number will, wind up, will be somewhere in Latin 1. And if you need to reach other Unicode code points, so higher numbers, it's just all these, uh, all these bits concatenate, right? So you can just string these along. So the first one is 110, and then afterwards it's all 10, right? So if you're reading a parser, don't write, write your own UTF-8 parser. Just plenty of them around. Um, second, you hit 110. None of the other characters you'll ever hit will start with 110. It'll be 0 or 10. And you stop after you stop hitting 10s, and then you have one character. So what's great about UTF-8 is it contains all of Unicode because you can like the standard just allows you to string more and more and more numbers. So if we wind up in some weird system, maybe with Martians or, or 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 some weird language where we'll need millions and millions and billions of different characters, well we can just extend UTF-8. Right? It's not limited like UCS. Um, backwards compatible with ASCII. So if you take an ASCII file. It is, UTF, it is a UTF-8 file, so your UTF-8 tools, your, your uh, uh, text editors, all that, can read an ASCII file, no need to convert it, no need to find other code points, no need to do anything, and no byte order. It's always uh, the most important byte first, basically. Like, the byte order is specified in the standard, it's not architecture dependent, which is really great. There's a thing called a byte order marker in Unicode, which is supposed to show you that byte order. Don't use it. Like only boring people from the 90s use it um, to fit around badly standards. Use UTF-8, and it shows up as a uh, as nothing at all. Like not even a space. So no point in using it. Hooray! Okay, this is always sorted, right? So we now have uh, a, a standard for showing text, or at least storing text on a computer hard drive or on an electronic medium, right? A um, couple of problems with UTF-8. It's a standard, every standard has problems, it's concessions to somebody. You cannot guess the length of strings. Because it's multi-byte, right, so I can't guess if a character is one, two, or three bytes. If I have 10 bytes of ASCII, I know that is exactly 10 letters long. If I have 10 bytes of, of UTF-8, I have no idea how many characters that is. It could cut off, cut off a character. So if I'm buffering and I'm reading a file one kilobyte at a time, my last, my, my kilobyte, the end byte could be the starting byte of a two-byte character. 
I have no way of knowing offhand without reading through the whole thing. With ASCII, I know it's all one bit, I just cut off my bits. But, in general, use UTF-8. If you need to choose an encoding, pick UTF-8. All the tools support it, all the web browsers support it, you can have URLs in UTF-8. The other ones are just too archaic and too much of it. But now for the point of all this, how is it done in Python? Okay. Up to Python 1.5, there was uh, no Unicode support at all. Uh, you would just not use it if you were, had to use another languages, or you'd use UTF-8, so it would be a series of bytes. It was all crappy. In 1.6, start beginning of Unicode support, and one of the big, so that was in 2000, one of the big features of Python 2.0, this is way before my time, uh, was apparently the Unicode type. Okay? So, uh, what is the Unicode type? Uh, what, they, what, the, what they wanted to do is, what they wanted to start off with in Python was, all right, everything's going to be Unicode. And then some people complained that, well, it's too complicated, like, it's different from representation on computer, and so they said to themselves, okay, 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 let's make a dirty hack. Let's make something that looks like a string, kind of responds to most things like a string, but we'll call it Unicode, right? So if you have straight up ASCII characters, ASCII characters are basically everything you can find in English, no accents, nothing crazy, you have a string, right? If you start your, your, your symbol with a U, and you put, in this case, uh, your text editor or your terminal will encode this as UTF-8 uh, as you enter it into your computer. Uh, uh, Python will decode that uh, looking at your uh, local, uh, sorry, encoding of your terminal or your text editor, and will figure that, and it says, oh, it starts with a U, uh, uh, beginning with a U, there's weird characters in it, it's a Unicode type, right? So what's interesting is that in Unicode, I can specify my Unicode code points. So this is in Python slash u, the number is, uh, this is the hex number of the Unicode standard code points. So if you dig into your PDFs, if you look at the tables, the, the headers and the rows, those match those numbers there. So if you see something cool in a, in a Unicode PDF, you can dump it directly into Python. Uh, you print it, it prints fine. Usually, as long as you have encoding of your terminal or you don't have any too many clashes. And what's the key here, right? So this is a Unicode character in UTF-8 being coded as three bytes, but Unicode is smart enough to realize this is only one character, so the length is one, right? So if you're only dealing with UTF-8, it, it wouldn't be smart enough to do that. For example, if I do encode, so this is how in Python 2 you'll convert between different encodings, so I'd have my in Unicode, I encode it to UTF-8. Uh, it shows up as these three byte characters, which matches that table I showed beforehand, right? And you then print it, it prints out fine because your terminals handles printing UTF-8, but if we do the length, it is now three bytes long, right? It, isn't, it thinks it's three characters long, which is not true because when you print it, you only get, wind up with one. So if I have a string like this, and I encode it in UTF-8, I wind up with those code points matching the, 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 the accented characters, and the rest show up as uh, ASCII, right? Because that's what they are. And if I decode it again, right? So my UTF is this, these things with these code points, I now wind up with, in this case, it doesn't show up as a character because my terminal's weird, but it'll just show you this is the Unicode code point, which is basically this UTF-8 here decoded. So everything's perfect, right? It all works fine. There's no, no headaches at all with this. Hooray. <laughs> Narrow Python builds. Uh, I've, uh, I was surprised because I hit this seven years ago, uh, and I didn't think it was still a thing, but apparently it is. So this is a really, really, really big, oh, sorry, this is a really high level uh, Unicode character. Uh, I think this is emoji. Oh yeah, it is. The emoji for the scary ghost. Oh, really cool emoji. Uh, emojis are like Japanese cell phone characters that I think 
uh, Apple and the Japanese cell carriers managed to shoehorn into Unicode standard, and Unicode people were like, but characters can't have colors and stuff, and they're like, but it's big in Japan. And, uh, <laughs> and, and it got in, and it's cool, like there's all these animated things, check it on Wikipedia. Chrome, who, who can I talk to this about? Chrome on Mac OS X doesn't support them. I have to use Firefox, I guess. Maybe that's a sign of the times. Um, because it's one character, there's one ghost on my screen, and yet Python thinks it's two. Because Python, by default, won't store things as UTF-8. It'll store as something called UCS-4. Uh, so it converts this into two bytes internally in memory, right? I mean, you shouldn't depend on, well, first of all, this is in CPython, and this is in a certain build of CPython. I know my, my, my home brewed install of Python on my Mac OS X machine, not this one at home, works that way. If you use Jyphon, I have no idea what's happening. PyPy, good luck. It's platform dependent. You shouldn't, if you're de especially if you're dealing with Unicode, like, it's supposed to be a higher level over these strings. You shouldn't have to care about these things, right? Collation. Pas collation, malheureusement. Collation. So I have a string, I have a list of strings, O, école, front, right? If I had those three words in a uh, French dictionary, the way it would wind up would be in that order, O, école, front. The way Python will sort them for you is O, front, and then école, which is a bit painful uh, if you're ever dealing with address books, stuff like that, be forewarned. Um, module support, oh, I'm, maybe you might have guessed it. I, I deal a lot with C, CSV files from random sources and stuff like that. So this always annoys me. So, oh, I had a Unicode string. Oh, I write it, it writes fine. Oh, let me throw a Unicode string. So on a, like, on a strongly typed system, like, uh, okay, it's weakly typed. I understand Python's a weakly type, but you kind of figure type for type, it should just be safe. No, it don't. It, C, uh, the CSV writer will tell you it has to be ASCII, or more precisely, if you encode it as UTF-8, it'll work. But it won't warn you beforehand. Uh, your unit test, because we use accents in unit tests, uh, will just pass flawlessly, and it's production at 3 a.m. in the morning that you'll figure this out. Oh, and <sighs> yeah, don't, just don't. Um, so I have Robert. I have a string, maybe get come from get text, maybe it's just in my code. I do string interpolation. Oh, right, I get a Unicode string. Okay, well, that's not what I was expecting. Maybe well, it makes sense that it wouldn't encode the Unicode and just upgrades to a higher standard. Oh, well, let, me, let, me, let me try in French. So this is a UTF-8 string, which is kind of subtle because there's no U in front. So my Python interpreter will see me type Cedilla C and because of how my terminal is set up, we'll, we'll encode that as UTF-8. It all falls apart. And, well, Robert is kind of, they could have kind of done it for me, but I can understand why they don't want to do it for me, but how, you know, maybe in the first case it should have failed. Like, it shouldn't be dependent on the contents of your strings. Uh, what are you going to do, clean up your strings? You can start trying to encode everything beforehand. In Python 2, what I recommend is stay in Unicode as long as possible and then make a wrapper on the lower level to decode into UTF-8 or whatever encoding you want. But it's a source of many unpredictable bugs, right? Um, but things, I think, personally, are a lot better in Python 3 for the simple reason that they do that differentiation. So uh, what used to be strings in the old language and everything, everywhere where you'd see uh, uh, sorry, what, what's now called uh, STRs in, in Python 3 is basically the old Unicode, right? So they're a series of characters. They're not bytes. They're a series of characters. They can be Unicode characters. They can be ASCII characters, but they're just a sequence of characters. The, uh, the bytes uh, type in Python 3, you don't have to care about the encoding because all it is is a series of numbers that are all underneath 256. Right? So what does that mean is um, you have to tell everyone uh, at all the steps of your programming what you want, right? So if you open a file as an R, 
right? So we all read the docs in Python 2 where they're like, oh, open a file. Oh, if you're in Windows, open it as RB because Windows, the Windows API does completely crazy things which for, for, for historical reasons, which you can understand, uh, if you don't do RB, right? In, in Windows, it'll change your return lines from something weird to something weirder. Um, but I, I don't know, I always programmed on, on Unix machines, so I always open files as R. In Python 3, this will bite you in the ass because you'll have to specify an encoding. And if you do, it'll automatically decode it for you. So instead of having uh, a, byte, a, a string of, of weird encodings that you're not sure, that you have to code yourself, it'll assume whatever encoding, I think by default it's UTF-8, probably, and then give you a string, a Unicode string, so uh, a sequence of Unicode characters. If you open RB, you get this uh, bytes uh, type, so it's just a sequence of numbers. It doesn't, it's not a string, you can't use string operators on it, or thought they're starting to, they're starting in newer versions of Python 3 to be a bit more acquiescent on that subject. Um, but, so, this is a byte string, right? I start off a B. I use characters to represent this, but all it's storing is the sequence of numbers that match the, the uh, UTF-8, in this case, characters that my terminal is giving. Oh, sorry, my, in this case, it gives a syntax error, because you cannot have a non-ASCII uh, character in a, sorry, you cannot have a non-ASCII character in a byte string, right? However, if I take this string, right, so this matches the U thing we had in Python, and then I encode it as UTF-8, I now get a byte string with the UTF-8 encoded, and this is a valid byte string, right? And if I decode it again, so matching the exercise we did in Python 2, I now get the str type, which can contain Unicode characters. If I take the Unicode version, it's a character. It's the reverse exclamation point. Okay, Jordy is not making big eyes, so I must have written it correctly. Um, however, if I encode it in UTF-8, so I'm going to wind up with this string, and I take the zeroth element of that array, right? It's a number. It's not a character. It's not a, a byte string of one character. It's a number, and that matches that first uh, UTF-8 number you had here, that first UTF-8 character you have here. So um, on the other end, when you write to a file, you have to specify write binary. And if you do, and you try to write a Unicode string, so this is a string that hasn't been encoded yet. So you got to think logically. Python doesn't know. You tried to open a file. He's told me write binary. So I'm just going to write bits on the wire. And now you're asking me to write in a Unicode string. I don't know what encoding to give it. It'll complain uh, uh, bitterly. But it'll complain whatever the string is, right? So it doesn't depend on the contents from the get-go, you run this through a unit test, it'll blow up right away. Vice versa, I open blah, uh, with just a W, so no, no longer this WB. I specify my encoding as UTF-8, as out, it's just a bit too long, and now I write a byte string, right? What you're saying is, you might be in the danger of double encoding this, right? So if this byte string had already UTF-8 characters, it might try to, UT, uh, to double encode, that would be horrible. So it just does the logical thing, gives you type error and, uh, and craps out. Um, so, so just my two cent rule, um, some couple rules of thumb, very high level that if you do not need to worry, if you don't want to worry about, if you want to worry about this, read the docs. Don't follow these rules, please, because, but if you do not want to worry about this, always use the base string, this, the str type in your code, right? Uh, always open wr with encoding and let your file reading or writing, take care of the encoding issues for you. So in your code, just deal with Unico uh, string Unicode characters. Don't worry about the encoding until the last possible moment. And you can use byte strings. That's completely fine if you need to do bit twiddling, uh, fighting with binary files, uh, cryptography, really cool stuff that you can do with binary strings. And then you just read it as a binary string. Use those numbers, uh, XORM, whatever you want and then you're in a much more comfortable position. Um, it's just that in Python 3, it's all separated for you. Uh, it forces you, I have to pick Unicode, or I have to pick byte strings, and no longer guessing, no longer on a Tuesday in these conditions, this code might react this, this way, and you won't wind up, and your code won't fail deep in its 
deep in its stack with some weird encoding error, it'll fail right away, and you'll be able easy, more easily able to find it. And um, that's it.